A public service announcement brought to you by Adopt US Kids, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the Ad Council. All righty. And, uh, huh? Bad shadows in the room, or am I growing a beard? Hmm, I shaved. So you probably just see the shadows on my face, and I cut my hair, so probably just, you know, you're seeing that. That rugged Miami Vice look. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, anyway. Okay, um, where the heck is he? Where's Daniel? Did we lose him? Daniel. Daniel Duvall, where are you? He should be here. We're missing him. I wonder if he got waylaid and delayed. I don't know. Do, do, do. Oh, there he is. There he is. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay. All right. He's a little late, but that's all right. We were ready. He was a little behind, but it's all worked out. Ladies and gentlemen, live from Chicago, the one, the only, preacher man, Daniel Duvall. What, you want applause? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah! woo, 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 woo. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Okay. Hey, you got your theme song. You got the big intro. You got the big voice. What What else do you want? Trumpets? Oh, my goodness. Man. Wow. Man. Boy, now you've had a little success. You're getting a little difficult to deal with, buddy. Oh, my goodness. No, I'm don't tell put that. <laughs> tell me. Man. Prima Donna or what? tell you she how you doing man I'm, I'm doing wonderful vince how are you doing i'm doing okay aside from the fact that i barbecued myself on the weekend man it's oh, man. i i don't know if i've ever had i mean it's i won't even go there it's just really gross how bad the burn is and we'll leave it at that but uh anyhow <laughs> um i got a little way late today but probably tonight after the show because i've been in contact with doug uh, I'm going to put the two of you in contact. I'm just going to send an email to you and him. Say, hey, Doug, meet uh, meet Daniel. Daniel, meet Doug, and let you guys uh, chat and talk. But uh, before we get into tonight, uh, it kind of interesting, and I think in some ways maybe even dovetails into all of the teaching you've been doing on the kingdom of God. What did you think of, uh, of Doug Hamp's uh, teaching on the image of God last night? Oh, you know, I was listening to it, and, I mean, it was great, Vince. It was absolutely great. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, the idea that we are created in his image and uh, that Adam lost that, but the fact that it has been placed back in us as a result of Jesus and his work on the cross and understanding the, um, the importance of that, I think, is absolutely essential. Because we are, we are walking bearers of the image of God, and um, that, is, that is absolutely powerful. Well, I enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot, man. So uh, it's neat uh, having both of you guys on. I mean, the teaching that we're getting now is just so incredible between the two of you guys. It's awesome. So thank you. For those no, who... and thank you, Vince, because, um, I mean, you're the host. And, you know, really thank you for uh, being willing to send me an email because, uh, you know, I really respect the guy and I love to get a hold of him. Oh, it'll, it, uh, yeah, it's all good. Um, let's bring folks up to speed, do a brief review, and then uh, let's journey on down this road. Great. Um, okay. So we've been talking about the kingdom. And, uh, you know, we're obviously talking about the kingdom of God. This means that, one, uh, God has a kingdom. And we have to understand what a kingdom is to understand what we're looking at. So... Uh, a kingdom is a form of government. Um, so this is all what we have already discussed, but we're just doing you know, a brief overview. We have a government that Jesus has had preached. And um, you know, we understand that when we're looking at a government, every government has a hierarchy. And, and hierarchy um, is relative to authority and status. And so... God's kingdom, being a kingdom, it has its own hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy maintains order. Uh, the, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. 
Okay, this is just foundational stuff. God is king. We take orders. We don't give the orders. Um, and the hierarchy goes God and then the saints, Christians, and then the angels. Uh, we talked about Psalm 8.5. It says that we have been made a little lower than the angels in the King James, but that's a uh, mistranslation. It, it is a little lower than Elohim, and that's the same word Elohim that was used in the book of Genesis when it says, um, you know, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. So uh, that's the plural Godhead. And uh, so we understand hierarchy. We, so, so then we, we understand that we are not uh, th the losers of this battle here on earth. God, Jesus, the work that Jesus has done, has elevated us so that we are standing in a posture as the sons of God. And, you know, uh, then the next level down, you know, we talked about um, a definition, a working definition. How do you define it? Say, if someone comes to you and says, well, sir, you're a Christian, tell me, what is the kingdom of God? And the kingdom of God is, it really boils down to the dimension where God is, king. The dimension where God is king. That, that means that God exists outside of the earth dimension, but he rules um, over all dimensions because he uh, occupies the highest dimension. And um, he has a kingdom there, and this kingdom infiltrates. Okay, and um, eventually it's going to consume and uh, bring all things under submission to, to Jesus. And, um, you know, so then when you ask the question, where is the kingdom? You know, we understand that it is another dimension, but the kingdom, according to Luke 12, verse 21 and 22, is within us. Or the, uh, the Amplified Bible says, in your hearts and surrounding you. Okay, so this dimension becomes an overlapping aspect of the life of the saint. In, in other words, you're supposed to bring the dimension of God and, and his rulership um, from this uh, higher dimension where he exists into the earth. And um, that's why it's in us. That's why it's there. And so, uh, you know, the kingdom then becomes more and more real to us as we reprogram our heart. And we talked about the heart being like a computer. And the computer, you know, you program the computer to run whatever... Uh, programs will be on it. If, if I want to have, you know, Microsoft Word on my computer, I have to install it. Uh, and so our heart becomes like a computer and we have to install the beliefs that what the Bible says and the realities of God's kingdom are true. And when we do that, that basically opens the floodgate of our heart and the kingdom realities can flow through our lives. Um, if we don't do that, then we, we kind of become a, a dam, like, like we dam it up so that the flow of God's power through us um, just doesn't quite ever manifest. And, and that all takes place really in the heart. And, and the heart is the uh, divider between the soul and the spirit. Okay? So um, we talked about all of that. We talked about how our spirit, you know, it's our mind, will, and emotions that's coming from the flesh side. And then our spirit is like a portal or a gateway to God. That, that's what the, the Spirit functions as. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.17, we have become one with the Spirit of God. Um, that, that means that the Spirit of God is eternally joined to our spirit. That's where we get the image. The image of God is in our spirit because the Holy Spirit has joined himself to it. So we carry that element of God. And uh, that, that cannot be um, ever, you know, sabotaged by the work of the enemy. There, there is something that becomes a seal on us. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is given a, a seal unto the day of redemption. So um, we understand that aspect. And, you know, last week we, we spent a lot of time talking about how uh, God, you know, he would appear in this earth realm from the third dimension where, where he resides uh, through, you know, portals. And whenever these portals would show up, there would be giant clouds, black clouds, and, uh, you know, to catch up. I know I'm going through a lot here, but, you know, to catch up, just listen to the other teachings. Um, and ultimately, he came into the temple of Solomon in this fashion, where the black cloud, it came out, the, the high priest, they could not go in and minister into the Holy of Holies. And I said, according to 1 Corinthians 6.19, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? 
which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. That means that the what happened in the temple then becomes a type and shadow of what God is doing through us. And God has basically put us as the exit point of the portal from um, his throne and his realm, his dimension, into the earth. And uh, that, that is how we are to function and how we are to view ourselves uh, when we engage this fallen world. Because we are not without power. God says he has given us the victory in all things, you know, through Christ Jesus. So that's basically where we've left off, Vince. Cool. So um, I think everybody's up to speed as far as where we've been so far. Uh, how do you want to tackle tonight? Well, I want to talk about um, how the kingdom arrived. Okay. And, uh, you know, th this is really important because this is another empowering message that really allows us to overcome the enemy with a new kind of confidence and a new kind of boldness that uh, I find is not inherent to most believers based on their belief system. And so... Um, however, before I tackle the, uh, the scripture, I, I want to give a little story, Vince, okay. because, uh, I, I, and I wrote this chuckling to myself. I said, you know, uh, so, sometimes we, we, stories help, uh, because, you know, it, it's fun, it's entertaining. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, it, it, it brings our barriers down, you know? And so, um, I have a story here and I'm going to tell it. Um, uh, and this story is about a prince, okay? A uh, good-looking guy, um, son of a king. Go figure. So once upon a time, there's this, this prince. Now, this prince lives in a castle with his father. And, uh, you know, his family. And, uh, he has everything, everything, Vince, that, that could be wanted. I mean... If, if it exists, he could have it. Like Lamborghinis, Ferraris, you name it. Um, you know, he is blessed. Uh, and, and, you know, he also has freedom. He, he's, he's free. He, you know, he, he's not uh, like, you know, Rapunzel or something tied up in, a, in, in the castle tower. So, so his father would tell him to go into the town and be an example to the townsfolk because the, the father believed in his son and he believed in... Um, you know, th th this guy's ability to be a good influence on the people in the town. Okay, so now the town was under the, the jurisdiction, the general jurisdiction of the castle where the king lived. And, and so he would go out to the townsfolk and, uh, you know, be an example. And now, this castle obviously was big and fabulous. It was glorious. It was so spectacular that when people looked at it, uh, they said that it would look like it was from another dimension. I mean, this thing was so amazing i mean it, it just boggled the mind it, you know they they couldn't figure out who the architect was it was just fa fantastic inside the castle it was perpetual paradise everything was polished with gold platinum uh precious stones you know and so this prince would go out of this castle he'd go into the town and he did his best to be an example usually he would make his trips to the town in the afternoon and many people respected him however uh one day he was feeling kind of mischievous. He, he just got this thing in him and he was like, huh, you know, I just want to be a little bad. I don't want to do something that bad, but I want to do something a little bad. You know, it won't hurt anybody or anything. So, so he decides that he's going to steal some, some grapes and lemonade, you know. Uh, so, so he goes and no one's looking and he swipes this stuff, goes off and uh, he eats it all, actually. You know, it's just one vine of grapes, a thing of lemonade and after finishing this food, he throws it in a nearby trash can, thinking no one will notice. Unfortunately, uh, someone does see him. And this person happens to be the town jester. Uh, you know, and a jester is like a clown-type entertainer, whatever. Uh, and this jester would always keep a keen eye on the inhabitants of the castle. Uh, because he was a little uh, jealous. You could say. So he was envious of them, and he took every opportunity to ruin their day. So this jester goes into the trash can, and he collects the evidence. He, he gets the empty grapevine that, that no longer has grapes. He gets the empty, uh, you know, can of lemonade, and he takes pictures. 
And he has these cronies, you know, he's got some thugs, these guys, you know, they're, they're real ugly. And um, he gives them some of the pictures, starts passing all this stuff out. And um, the next day, the prince comes back into the town and the jester begins to yell at him. He accuses the prince of being a thief and a crook. And then the jester tells him that he had already told the prince's father and that he was going to be put on punishment. And the prince is distressed because he feels so guilty. He is so guilty because he knows that he, he did something wrong. But now to know that he is definitely going to be put on punishment. And as a matter of fact, the jester goes further to say that his father would not be talking to him. And the next time his father saw him, he, would be, he was going to put him in prison. And, I mean, uh, the prince is just so sorrowful. He, he's... His insides are groaning. He feels so guilty. He just feels the weight of everything that he has done wrong. He feels like he has failed, you know, his father's name, his own name. He, he, and he's looking at this thing like there's no, there's no way out of this. There's no redemption. He's going to, my father is going to put me in prison. My father won't talk to me anymore. My father is, is abandoning me because of what I did. And, and so the prince is so ashamed. And he believes everything the jester says. And... So he wanted to go and run to the king, which is his dad, but he's so full of fear that he can't. And so he makes a decision and he says, I'm not going back. I'm going to stay outside of the castle from now on. Now, at this point, the jester knows that uh, he's winning. So he begins to steal from the prince. Every time the prince lays down to take a nap, stops paying attention, puts some of his stuff down, the jester comes and steals it. First, he steals the prince's jewelry, then his ornaments, and eventually, he steals his very clothes. Uh, on one occasion, when the prince catches the jester stealing some of this stuff, because this happened over a little bit of time here, it wasn't just all at once, but over time, all this stuff begins to slowly disappear. And, you know, uh, he catches the jester... And the jester tells him that his father gave him permission to take the stuff because the prince wasn't worthy of it. So the prince continues to wallow in self-pity, assuming that all that was happening to him was by direct orders of his father. And it wasn't long before he was standing cold, naked, and hungry in a slum of town, surrounded by the photos of the enemy empty grapevine and lemonade cup. I mean, they posted these pictures everywhere around him. So where he was staying... All he could do every time he looked up was to see this and feel the condemnation just piercing him. And the jester and his cronies, you know, they stole everything. Eventually, they stole his socks, Vince. They stole his socks. And so um, when there was nothing left to steal, the jester and his cronies would show up just to beat up on the prince for fun. Um, thinking that this also came as a direct order from his father, the prince would just hang his head and take the beatings. Uh, they would use several types of weapons um, because they were creative. So they had the bat of depression. They had the sickle of sickness, the whip of lack. They had the gloves of disgrace. And they had the crowbar of fear. They had all these weapons, and they would just come by, beat them up, then leave them there. And when the beatings stopped to satisfy the jester and his cronies, they began to plan how they were going to murder the prince. Now, at this point in the story, something unexpected happens. There's a man by the name of Dr. Faith, and this guy shows up. Um, now, Dr. Faith walks over to the naked, bleeding, and shamed prince, and, and he says this. He says, what's up, bro? And the, the prince begins to tell Dr. Faith about all of his troubles and how his father had given the jester orders to destroy his life because he ate stolen grapes and drank lemonade that he didn't buy. He began to weep and cry and agonize, and, and um, it was so terrible as the prince began to express all of his anguish, emotion. Now, Dr. Faith just sat there and listened. And uh, when the prince was finally finished, going and bawling his eyes out and talking for a few hours, he looks at Dr. Faith confused because Dr. Faith doesn't even feel bad for him. And, and he says, well, why don't you feel bad for me, Dr. Faith? And the, the prince is very frustrated. He's so angry because he, he can't believe the nerve of this guy. And, um, you know, 
Now, the, the prince's father has a lot of children. And uh, actually, the prince's father has so many children that the prince doesn't even really know all the children that his father has. And this is what Dr. Faith says. He says, well, to be honest, prince, uh, your daddy's my daddy. Um, I know we don't you know, look alike, but what can I say? As a matter of fact, I was just hanging out with the old man. You know, he gave me everything I need. He gave me a beautiful wife. Um, he gave me a killer sword. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed. And as a matter of fact, he was asking about you because you haven't been around in a while. And he has a bunch of blessings that he wants to pour out on your head. And did you ever bother to ask the father, your, uh, the king, about what this jester said? You know, the jester isn't even allowed in the palace. Now, at this point, the prince is utterly confused because the jester said that he went to the palace. And the jester said that his father was putting him on punishment. As a matter of fact, the jester said that his father gave him permission to steal everything he had. But when he thought about it, it gave it some time. He realized that he never actually asked his father. And suddenly this light bulb begins to float on top of the prince's head. And Dr. Faith, realizing that this uh, light bulb has just emerged, continues, and he says this. He says, listen, brother, let me level with you. You're deceived. In other words, your belief system and thinking is backwards, and you gave the jester your own permission to destroy your life. I know you feel like an idiot, but that's okay, because at least you're still alive. Now, the Bible says when the thief is caught, he shall restore sevenfold, even to the whole of his house. Let's go to the king's throne and make our case against this jester and his cronies. And that's how, that's how the story ends. And um, now, uh, what I want to talk about is why this story is relevant to understanding the kingdom. So this involves understanding how the kingdom arrived. So sh should we just jump in, Vince? When we take a break right here, and then you can just go for it for the rest of the uh, the rest of the hour, okay? Sounds great. Perfect. All right, Daniel Duvall, the Kingdom of God. This is great stuff. Don't go away. We will be right back. And thanks very much for being with us tonight. <laughs> 